you saw a disproportionate amount of people today with problems from fat grafting. They thought maybe it was old filler, maybe it was swelling under the eye or in the lip or wherever it was. I had to show them that maybe this was something else. So the things that I saw problems with were some fat grafting under the eye in two patients. One of them I sent to Dr. Massery. You're welcome. <laughs> so it's a difficult thing to fix. That's fat grafting under the eye. The other one was fat grafting in the lip and the other patient had fat grafting in the chin. What went wrong? So first off, let's talk about fat grafting. Fat grafting is a very, very nice tool to use, but by no means is fat grafting inherently natural just because we take it from your body and put it into your body. You're taking it from your ass and putting it into your face. And I've said this many times, there's nothing about ass to face that's natural or stomach to face or thigh to face. These aren't natural things. We use them because we can benefit from them, but it's not a purely natural thing to do. So that means that things might go wrong things that you do see from fat grafting, one is you can see growth over time. So you inject fat into somebody and for some reason those areas grow just like in the under eye. So what happens? One is you can cause lymphatic drainage obstruction, which means you put a bunch of fat into different layers and you actually squeeze out your lymphatic ducts and cause fibrosis or scarring around them. They don't drain so well, you get puffy. So you injected this much fat, but you get that much fullness. That's one thing. Another is hormonal changes. Hormonal changes can occur at any time in someone's life. It happens in women more than men because they go through something called menopause. Around that time or around any other rapid fluctuations, you can get these changes where you get changes in the receptors on the fat that get attacked more by different hormone levels and they grow for some reason. We don't know why this happens exactly, but it's because of hormone fluctuations. And remember, this fat didn't come from your face, so it won't act like the fat in your face. It'll act like the fat from your ass, which goes crazy sometimes. The other is with weight gain. So as you gain weight in life, the fat that you injected into the face will weight gain, not like your face did, like your body did so disproportionately and usually it's from the abdomen where we all have this little pooch love that pooch hate that pooch but that is what it's going to grow like so we have to take all these things into account including another thing called fibrosis. So when you inject fat into the face, it causes an inflammatory reaction. This might do nothing. This might benefit you because you have little stem cells that are released from it. And it might have a negative effect where you cause granulation tissue formation, just like if you had injected Sculptra, which means you inject fat and then you actually gain volume, not because the fat grew, but because you formed little balls of granules around it. So you injected that much fat that turns to that much because you have scar tissue within it now. So all these things can happen with fat. Fat's a lovely thing though. You just have to know how to use it. You have to inject it deep in certain areas, avoid certain surface irregularities and always think about the future. What if all this fat lasts? What if this person gains weight? All that stuff. In this patient with the under eye issues, the person who had injected it almost certainly injected into the wrong plane. They didn't go down into the soup or down onto that bone where you can palpate. They tried to get too much of a correction and thought it was a healthy thing to do and injected deep to superficial. That is going to cause a problem more often than not. If you inject it like we do, you go down deep and you inject tiny little bits and you're totally fine. And you can mix it with PRP to make the fat even take better in some people. As far as the lip goes, this is the fun part. The lip is not a good place to inject fat. That is a statement coming from me who's a lip specialist. So you can listen to me or you can listen to the non-lip specialist. It's, you know, it's up to you. Do whatever you like. But I'll tell you, fat in the lip is extremely difficult to control and there is no natural fat plane that exists in the lip. Ask a doctor, is there a natural fat plane in the lip? If they tell you yes, it means they don't know the anatomy of the lip. The vermilion, which is this area over here, is mucosa, which is the pink. It turns into a different kind of mucosa on the inside that has, rather than keratinized, just regular squamous epithelium. And then deep to that, you have something called submucosa with lamina propria. This is your cushy layer that is similar to the SMAS. Below that is your orbicularis muscle, and that's all you got. There's no fat there. If you go into the upper lip philtrum, you have epidermis, dermis, which is like that big. You have your SMAS, which is that big. And then you have your muscle, which is also that big, similar size in most people, a little bit bigger than the SMAS. So the SMAS itself is your your hydrating layer. That's what contains the fluid that makes this cushy and resists you wrinkling it and pinching it. That's what resists it. It's that cushy smass layer. It does have microscopic fat within it. You see some yellow and it's got microscopic fat within it, but there's no fat layer. There is an 
exception. On some people, you see a very thin palisading fat layer that's under the dermis. It doesn't exist on everybody or not to a notable extent by the time I operate on them, so it's very hard to see. Regardless, there is no natural fat plane. So where does fat incorporate? It cannot incorporate. It just sits. If you put a very, very small amount, you'll probably be fine. I've done that. I've had no issues, but I've also done it and immediately went and did a lip lift or a corner lift and saw that it immediately went up here. This is the problem. The lamina propria, which is where you're injecting that loose glide layer in the vermilion is directly attached to the smas of the upper lip, meaning you get immediate spread of the filler in there. Who taught me the difference to differentiate between spread and migration? I used to call them kind of the same thing. I said it just migrates. It's Dr. Steve Harris. He's in London and talks about this all the time. I think it's a good differentiator because when you inject into the lamina propria and it goes into the smas, that's spread. It means it didn't migrate over time. You pushed it in there. It means you put it there. Migration means it crawled there. It got there over time. Migration doesn't typically happen with fat, although you can have edema that happens in other areas. Migration doesn't really happen with fat. You do have spread though, meaning you injected it and it went this way instead of that way. That's fat. So when you inject fat into the lip in large globules, it can travel inside and spread or it can travel upwards and spread in the vermilion. These can both happen. When I inject fat into the upper lip, I do the tiniest amount and I turn it into micro fat. I break it up. I actually hope sometimes it doesn't survive. I just want to give a little rejuvenation to it and get it better hydrated. Sometimes I break up the fat into nano fat and now we're talking. You take nano fat, which is stem cells of fat or adipose derived stem cells, and you break up the fat, turn it into a liquid, mix it with PR, and you can inject that into the upper lip filtrum, or you can inject it into here and the lip will look healthier. As we age, you'll see some people get darkening along this area of the mustache line and they get indentation or a shadowing. This happens with age when the smash thins. It also happens after a dissolver on some people. You can actually regenerate that or get it better in most people with just doing nano fat PRP injections in there and doing a little CO2 laser to stimulate it. That seems to work really, really nicely, but I do advise patients, doctors especially, be very careful injecting fat into the lip. You have a high chance of causing irregularities that are difficult to fix and to fix them once they migrate up here you have to go from a lip lift to get to it or you have to go through a direct vermilion incision and it's very difficult because once you do it and remove that fat everything else deflates and collapses so it's never a easy nice thing to do it's very inflammatory and people can get swollen for a very long time so don't do things you can't fix fat injections are one of those things where they're very difficult to fix so when you do it you better do it right do it conservatively and do it in the right areas do it where fat planes naturally exist okay so there's areas in the face although it's a different fat we're injecting fat naturally exists, fat can incorporate in there and replace fat atrophy or fat loss. I would be very cautious to put it where fat naturally doesn't exist very much. Another thing to think about is buckle fat. If you ever take it out, don't just throw it away. It's a very valuable, smooth stem cell rich fat that's naturally occurring in the face. It's a beautiful fat to mince up just a little bit because it'll explode if you mince it too much and not last. Put it into a syringe and then directly inject it into around the eyes where it matches the orbital fat or you can do it in the cheeker areas like that. So that would be lesson of the day for today. Fat grafting is a beautiful thing to do if you know how to do it well, but don't do too much and do not assume ass to face is a natural thing. Don't quote me on that. It means two different things. I hope that helps. And if you have problems with fat injections, don't come to me.